Yes, any questions? So far, so good? Okay. Yeah, it will get a little bit trickier as we move along. But just a little bit, okay? So, let me take this out. Uh, I should perhaps say that uh, in all those cost elements we discussed, we cannot always assume this linear proportionality stuff, so we cannot keep to these linear costs, to at least for the moment. Um, it's a simplification, of course, but um, that is something one have to live with in the world of logistics. Okay, let's uh, look at an example now. Paragraph 3, 4 in the textbook, there is an example. Okay, in order to look at a production or aggregate production planning example, we need a set of demand forecasts as we started with. That must be the input. Okay, so let's start with those. We have some uh, forecasts. for product demand. And we assume a single product here, by the way. Of course, in most cases, most manufacturers produce more than one, and that adds some more difficulties, which we will not look at, uh, at least not here. Okay. For product, product demand, and uh, we look at uh, demand uh, in uh, a monthly basis here, so we have our forecasts, there is a forecast for January, which is 1280 units. So this is uh, product units, or some kind of product, it doesn't really matter what it is. February, we have uh, 640. Uh, March, we have uh, 900. April, we have 1200. May 2000 and uh, June 1400. Okay, so this is assumed uh, existent uh, uh, for this example. Now we want to say something about these smoothing costs. So we want to introduce the workforce here and we want to look at it. Uh, what we will do first now is to look at two different manual plans. We look at the so-called minimal inventory plan and the constant workforce plan. So you should kind of get the feeling here that the workforce is kind of important here. So uh, more information to our example than the demand forecast. Of course we need, if we want to manipulate the workforce, we need to know how many people we have hired today. Okay, so uh, we kind of enter this planning process with a certain factory or manufacturing unit and uh, there are some persons hired already. So today there are 300 employees and another grave simplification that we do in this example and in the continuing model is that an employee is the same whatever. Okay? There are no different categories, no different skills, no different costs. So this is a kind of special company, okay? They can kind of use people for a, perhaps a fairly simple operation. And any people work as good as any other people. So there is no kind of different difference on the employees. Then there is existing inventory. So in most uh, companies, when we kind of go in at a certain point, you already have some objects steadily there at your inventory house. And so is the case here. Uh, it's given as a number here as 500 units of the given product. Okay, so we have something available. So if our demand here had been only adding up to less than 500, we didn't have to produce anything in this period. Okay. But you see there is a little bit more demand here, so we perhaps need to, to have some production to meet this demand. There is also a wish on ending 
inventory status. And it's put here at 600 units. These numbers here are of course kind of decided in a different planning process in the company. Um, we will uh, relate to these kind of problems later on. Okay? But uh, the point here is that we have a fair amount available when we start our planning. But we also want to have a similar kind of amount, slightly higher here, 100 units higher, when we finish this planning period. So uh, all this information is necessary uh, for kind of working out this example. But we're missing uh, a fair deal yet, aren't we? We need some costs here. How much things cost, what it costs to hire and fire and so on, and possibly subcontracting and so on. Okay, all these costs we discussed, they must kind of be put numbers on them to, to kind of continue and finish this example. Uh, and, others, and other stuff. Okay, and um, what we could do now to make, uh, make it easier is to say that this number and this number can be used immediately to kind of change our given demand, can't it? Because if we have 500 already on inventory, then we don't have an effective demand of 1280 in January, do we? We have 1280 minus 500, which is the effective. So we can immediately kind of take this out and put it in instead of 1280 here. <coughs> so it should be 1280 minus 500. How much is that? That's 780, isn't it? So we can write 780 here. And if we need to have 600 units left, then of course we might add 600 to this 1400 to kind of adjust the demand profile. So we can do that as well. So we just substitute 1400 with 2000. Uh, these, these 2,000 comes from 1,400 plus 600. <coughs> so, then we don't need to care about this anymore, do we? We can kind of take that out of our head. So that is kind of fixed now. Yeah. It's taken care of. As long as we stick to this demand plan, we will fulfill, take care of this added information here. Okay, so this is the basics. Then we need to talk a little bit about costs. You recall we kind of sketched six different cost elements, but we will kind of stick to only two of those. Okay? We will stick to two smoothing costs elements and an inventory cost. So we kind of even go stronger when it comes to approximation than in the, in the actual structure we looked at. So I think I will keep this demand here. And uh, remember the 300 employees we had now, okay? We need to use them for something later on here. So, more assumptions. We look at two cost elements or actually three. Two of the type smoothing, of the smoothing type, and one inventory. So we define CH. Now this is this proportional cost constant, the kind of number which we multiply with the number of hires we do. So this is the hiring cost. Hiring cost, and it's given a number here of 500. So each time we hire a new person, it costs us 500 something dollars or kroner or whatever. If we have a higher cost, we probably also should have a fire cost. Do you think that higher costs are bigger or smaller than fire costs? There is some costs involved in firing people, at least in Norway, okay? You may face some trials, you may face some union problems, so there is some uh, time going on with fire. I actually did fire a person here, hmm. last year I think, 
It was a very long process. A lot of lawyers, a lot of time was spent, so it was quite expensive, actually. Mm. Probably more expensive than hiring, even though hiring might be very expensive as well. Of course, it depends on what kind of people you want to hire. If you want to hire very skilled labor internationally, it's uh, typically a very big process with a lot of time spent, a lot of consultants, a lot of analysis and so on. Okay, so this normally costs some money, but in, in most cases, uh, Firing is more expensive than hiring. This depends somewhat on what kind of country you're in. Okay? Less developed countries normally have a political system which makes it maybe easier to fire. I don't hope I offend anybody now, but uh, at least that's my impression. It may not be less expensive than hiring, but uh, maybe the difference is larger in the more developed countries, where there are kind of more stable union systems and, and organizations who take care of the workers. Okay. Firing costs, in any case, are assumed twice here, so they are a thousand. And then we have an inventory cost, let's call it CI, which is inventory Tory cost. Inventory is, of course, something which changes dynamically. Okay? It could change every second if you have a, a high, uh, high demand structure. So we have to make some decisions on how to measure this inventory cost. The idea here, of course, is that we multiply this inventory cost with the number we have in inventory in a certain time period. But that number may change, okay? So in logistics, we do another approximation here. We either say that we look at average inventory in the time period, which we then multiply with the, the cost component, or even simpler, we could look at end inventory in a certain period. So this depends, but okay, we, we just need to make some decision here on how to kind of measure these costs. And as I said, our assumptions here of this proportional cost structure may be very misleading, at least for the two first ones here, because if either if you hire one or two persons, it may be kind of the same cost in, in practice, or at least not very much bigger. So there is typically non-linearities in the real cost structures here. But we overlook these nonlinearities in, in this example and typically in, in this course. Okay. Uh, there is even some more information here. Uh, let's draw a line here and try to put this information here. Okay. Um, we have some observations here. And recall now that we only have a single type of worker here, okay? There's a single product and a single type of worker. So if I kind of hire more people, I also assume that these people, they kind of contribute to increasing my production level. If I fire, I'm able to take down my production level. So this is an extremely simplistic model of reality. But still, it's far more complex than the model we discussed last time of this production function in microeconomics. That's even more simplistic. Even though this one is simpl simplistic, we start discussing both people categories, inventory, and so on. So we kind of add a little bit more to the production function than you normally do in microeconomic theory. So we have observed something here. We have observed uh, over a period of 22 days, so we have some history behind here, where we have observed what has happened here. Then, in this period, we had 26 workers. And these 26 workers, they produced 245 units. Now, if these 26 workers in this 22-day period, and this production volume of 245 is kind of representative for what should happen or would happen in any real setting after this time, then we can use this information to calculate how much a single worker could produce in a single day, for instance, couldn't we? That's straightforward. And then we can use that measure to kind of transform our workforce into production. That is the idea by this model. So there's kind of an automatic type of model. We add people, that increases production. 
by the productivity of each individual worker. Again, of course, extremely simplified. Reality is far more complex than this. Okay, if I now take 245 and divide by 22, then I get a number that is 11.1364. And that is the units I am able to produce per day with these 26 workers, isn't it? So this is the number of units produced per day. This is the number of units produced per day, okay, given these, these observations. Oh, it wasn't 26, sorry, it should be 76. I have to keep my numbers correct here, I think. That was a, a misprint, sorry about that. Now if I take this number, 11.1364, and divide by the number of workers I have, then I get this productivity number, which tells me how much each worker produces per day. 76, then I get 0 0.1451. And this number will be important because it defines the link between my workers and my production volume. So by kind of letting people out, then I take down my production, putting people in will increase my production automatically. As we all know, it's a bit more complex than that. But okay, this model kind of do, does it in this fashion. Okay, okay. Now what it says here is that we should look at, now at this point we have kind of defined our example. Okay, we have all necessary information. We know our demand forecasts. We know the costs of the components we want to include in the model. We have decided to include a kind of subset of all possible relevant costs. So we'll just look at a few of those. We have our productivity, we kind of know what happens if we hire more people or fire more people? Because we, that will kind of result in a number of workers. Those, that number of workers can be multiplied with this number to produce the production in that time period. We also know how many people are in the business at the moment. That is 300. We took that out, but it was put up. So if you take 300 multiplied by, by this number, that says something about our kind of given production capacity. Kind of tells us how much we're able to produce from now on and future on, unless we do something with the, the people involved. And it says here that we want to look at kind of two different type of production plans. A production plan here now contains how much we will produce in each period, how many hires we do in each period, and how many fires we do in each period. When those three variables are defined, of course, we can also compute the inventory level, can't we? Because we know at with these numbers, we have nothing on inventory for the start because the, three, the 500 has been in included here. So that kind of opens up for looking at different production plans. Now we can make decisions. And decisions we make typically is hiring and firing. If I define how many people I have in a certain time period, then my production is defined through this number. So I can kind of tune here by adding more people, taking more people out, and if I add too many people in a certain period, then of course my production level might be higher than the demand in that period, if you think about January. Now I have 300 employees, don't I? 300 times this number is... But this is per day. Then I need something else, don't I? I need to know the number of days in each month, okay? That is needed as well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> So we need that, okay. Number of working days in each month. That must be defined, okay? So let's see here. In January, we assume there are 20 working days. In February, 
we assume there are 24 in March we assume 18 in April we assume 26 in May we assume 15 so we had to have this in addition as we actually need to transform this productivity by multiplying with our number of workers and of course the number of days to get the total production volume in a certain month. Now you can see from these days that they differ between months. Do you think that seems reasonable? Do we have different working days in different months? Yeah. Why is that uh, Maria? The months don't have the same number of days. Yeah, there are certain months that have 30 days, so they have 31. And there is a single month, so either have 28 or 29, which is February. But that may not account for such a difference. You agree? So there must be something else. That could be holidays, couldn't it? We have Easter holiday, maybe. In that it should perhaps be in March here. And if this is Norway, we know there's a lot of uh, special holidays in May. So. So this, this may be reasonable, even though this, it's not, that is not the point here. The point is to accept that it should be different working days, and it may be fair amounts of differences between these days. So now we kind of have what we need. So let us look at one of the tables in the textbook. Okay. So we just keep the information here, and we had initial workforce. Oh, 300 and then I think we kind of have all information which is relevant on the board here we have the productivity factor we have the number of days in each month we have the actual reduced demand so to speak we have the costs and we have the initial number of people in our business then we have everything we need to kind of start looking at plans and as I said constructing a plan here is kind of tuning these variables if you like on whether to hire or fire. Then we start in January here. We know we have 300 people. And of course, if we hire 10, then we suddenly have 310. That gives a certain production. If we, let's say, we hire 300 people, then we end up with 600 people starting to produce in January. And 600 times 0 0.14, that would be, how much would that be? Around 90 or something, multiplied by 20. 90 times 20, that is 1,800, isn't it? Which is far more than the demand in January. So if we do that, then we will kind of have a certain amount adding to our inventory. Okay. Either we produce to cover demand, and which is not put into demand, is flowing directly, smoothly into our inventory hall, without kind of interfering with what's happening here. So. What we would like to do here is to look at two special manual plans. The first one is referred to as the minimal inventory plan. And the minimal inventory plan is often called make to order in logistics, meaning that you kind of produce for the demand which is there. So you, kind of, you don't need to kind of put things in inventory if you kind of are able, have, the, have enough production capacity to kind of meet demand as it comes on. Of course, in this case, we know what demand is for the next one, two, three, four, five, six periods. By our assumption that this is a deterministic model, so we kind of know what will happen here. <coughs> so it, what, what will typically happen in a minimal inventory plan is that we will use these hire and firing vari variables a lot, wouldn't we? We will do exactly kind of hire the amount of people we need in one period and then fire them in the next period if then the demand goes down. So it will be a lot of fuss in our work workforce, uh, a lot of hiring, a lot of firing. Okay? But we will, we will not keep inventory. The other extreme, kind of the other option here, is to use a so-called constant workforce plan. In a constant workforce plan, you kind of increase your workforce to a kind of reasonable level such in a way that you don't have to hire or fire anyone after that point. Okay, then you keep the work stock constant. The workers would like that situation, don't you think so? They're not so happy with situations where they're kind of firing 
So you work uh, one week and then there's two weeks without payment and then you come back again. That's not a, an ideal situation for workers. So th this could be kind of uh, called uh, the, the, the social worker type of plan. This is more kind of a capitalistic way of thinking. Okay, so but it, we, are not, we do not know at this point which one of these plans are most costly, do we? We don't know until we actually have looked at them, constructed them, and calculated their costs based on this. Okay? So let's do that. <coughs> uh, the general idea here is perhaps that you would expect that the optimal plan, or the plan which is cheapest of all possible plans, is somewhere in between here. Okay, these are kind of two extremes. Either you, you focus on using no inventory, or you focus on using kind of maximal inventory in the sense that you, that you, you, you keep a constant workforce. You would probably expect that the, the, the cheapest of all possible plans is somewhere in between. And we will see that that is the case. That is exactly the case here. But before we do that, let's uh, have a look at um, some tables in the textbook here. They are put up in, under the lecture notes here. I I think we might uh, look at them here instead of drawing them on the blackboard. Okay, so we start with the zero inventory plan and look at uh, how we can achieve that. Okay. Now this is kind of simple, isn't it? This is the number of working days, okay? I take that number, I multiply it with my productivity factor, which was down there, 0 0.1465. Uh, a few more digits here, but it's the same number. So that tells me kind of the production amount for a single worker in January, okay? Now I need 780 units in January, and if I take 780 and divide by this number, that should tell me the number of workers I need, okay? It seems straightforward. No, no real problem here, okay? And of course you continue this argument to the next month, February, and there are more days, you get a slightly bigger number here, because again you multiply this with this factor here, so it increases a little bit. And there is less forecast for February, so again you take this 640 divided by 3.517 and you arrive at 182. So this is kind of the minimal number of workers you need in each period to more or less exactly hit the demand profile. And you know, we know that we, have, we start with 300 here. Okay, so we can see what will happen, can't we? We'll have to fire a, a fair amount here in the first period to get at exactly 267. Actually we have 300, that would be how much? 33 or something? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Then we'll have to fire a substantial amount in the next period again to get down at end, and we have to hire, fire, hire, and hire, okay? So uh, let's look at the next table where we kind of have done this directly. Uh, close this tab, we can keep that one. I'm constantly confused by this uh, Windows 7 system. Okay. So here is kind of trying to sum up the effect of this thing. Here is the numbers of workers we need from the previous table. Okay, set up again. And here we have our decisions. Okay, this is what we decided to do. We had to fire 33 in the first period to get down to 267. Then we have to fire 85 more to get further down to 182. Now we have to hire 160 to get up to 342 again. Again, another fire to get down to 315. We have to fire 27 out of the, the 342 we had. Then we have to hire a, a big amount to get up to the 621, 306 to be exactly, and then even more, 289 up to 910. So we just sum together here, we see we have totally hired 7 and 755 persons, and we have totally fired 145. And here you see the consequences on the, the, the worker figures we looked from the previous table. 
the actual numbers produced, you see there is some round-offs here, okay? So we end up with a few small numbers, which kind of adds up. The reason is that we, we have some, some round-offs here, okay? We, 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 we kind of don't accept uh, situations where we, where we have... Uh, we could solve this, couldn't we, by letting some of the workers be just a percentage precision, okay? Added for 20% to 37.5%, we haven't chosen to do that. So there is just some very small numbers here, which really are not significant anyway. They, they add slightly to our total cost, but not very much. But of course, this is a so-called constant, no, sorry, minimal inventory plan. Okay, it uh, produces at least almost no inventory, just rounding off inventory, and it uh, involves a lot of activity on the labor market, so to speak. We have to take in and take out a lot. Now some of you are citizens of maybe less developed countries. Is these kind of strategies which are normal in some of your countries? Or in farming, for instance, harvest, you, you come for a week, you have work, and then you have to go to another place, maybe? Yeah. 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 And then in some mines as well. Some mines as well, yeah. When there's no more gold, you have to take out the workers and shoot for some more. And <laughs> I expect it. that's kind of a different reason, isn't it, than this one? Yeah. In Norway, this is not normal. But still, in Norway, there are certain businesses where it kind of is allowed, in a sense. You know, in the primary business, like farming, but not so much there, but mainly in fisheries. Then it's, it's fairly normal to have this seasonal working, so people work for a month, and then there's no work, and they come back after Christmas and have a few weeks and so on. So that, that has a long tradition for this kind of very flexible way of, of structuring the work life. Of course, as, as the unions has developed in the Western world, it's been much tougher for the, for the, employee, for the, for the owners to kind of do this stuff. The, the workers don't like it. So, so there's kind of a, a struggle here, as you probably understand. Okay. Now, what we can do now then, of course, is to, given this information, is to, based on these costs here, I didn't write the inventory cost, did I? Sorry about that. It should have a number. I think it was 80, wasn't it? Let me just check, okay? So I don't lie too much to you. Yes, it was 80. Now, when I have these costs, I can, of course, construct the cost of this plan. And that is the idea here, to see how much cost it involves. So now I take this out, okay? I don't think we need these for the moment. Let me just repeat the costs on top here. So we had a hiring cost of 500, a firing cost of 1000, and an inventory cost of 80. Now we can, as we say, evaluate the, this plan or find the cost of it. Evaluating the minimal inventory plan. Okay, let's do that. Then we have hiring costs. Hiring costs. We have performed 755 hirings. Each hire costs 500. That produces a cost of 377,500 something. We don't bother with the units here. Then we have firing costs. Uh, the firing costs, they are, uh, there are 145 firings, and each one costs a thousand. That produces 145,000. And then, of course, it's this uh, very rudimentary inventory cost. We may just add it for completeness. So there is some inventory here. Inventory costs. Actually, approximately zero, so in, in practice you would just drop it, but uh, 
to, to, to kind of do things neatly here. No, we have a total ending inventory of 30. So we kind of think here that uh, we use the ending inventory. So here we have an ending inventory of 3. That means that if the inventory cost is 80 per unit, we take 80 times 3. Okay, and then we get 3 ending here, so it's still 80 times 3, and it moves on like this. And of course that means that we just can add together all this and multiply by 80 in the end. So it's 30 times 80, which is a small number. 3 times 8 is 24, so it's 2,400, isn't it? That is the very insignificant uh, cost component of inventory here. Of course, we can add these numbers together then to produce the total cost. Total cost of plan. And we get uh, zero there, zero there. Then there's a five, this should be nine. Uh, 14, and we're there, 7, 8, 2, I get 524, 900, yeah, that seems right, okay, that is the total cost of this plan. Okay, any questions? Is this straightforward? You, you notice the kind of particularity of this model, okay? It's a, it's a kind of an automatic production structure. You kind of put people in and you get product out, okay? That's uh, in that case, it kind of resembles this product function of microeconomics. But we have this inventory part here, okay, which we did not have there. And of course, we also had the possibility of hiring and firing people here, which we kind of didn't have there, okay? So, so it's, it's a bit more complex. But in many ways, in a similar approximate fashion. Of course, in reality, if you were to do this, you'd have to look at different categories of people. Okay? You have those who have a bachelor, those who have a master, and so on, and different salaries and different costs and different firing and hiring costs. So there will be different hiring costs for the high skilled personnel, different, maybe higher firing costs, and so on. Okay? And this will kind of make this even much more complex, okay, because we have a lot of different categories that we have to take care of here. In principle, not difficult, but uh, to kind of master in your head, more, more difficult. Okay, so this is uh, one outcome or uh, our analysis so far. Okay, we found, uh, we looked at a certain plan, we kind of defined, this is the plan we would like to look at, and it has a certain cost, okay. Now let's look at the alternative, which we also formulated, the, the constant workforce plan. Then I just take these out, I think. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can keep the costs here. No, we can write them up later on. Now, if we want to construct a constant workforce plan. I, it's kind of obvious that we can hire a lot of people, isn't it? I, if I hire 10,000 people here, then of course I can, uh, I can meet this demand, but of course then I will produce a lot of inventory. Okay. And in principle I'm not allowed to that because I should have a certain amount left. And I'm not taking care of that, by the way, without actually doing this in a more sensible way. So what we're actually aiming to find here is kind of the, the kind of most efficient or yeah, that's what we're aiming for. The kind of the, the constant workforce plan that kind of produces the smallest possible number to hire in the first period. That's what, what we're looking for. So it's kind of the, the, ch the cheapest constant workforce plan. So we kind of do a slight bit of optimization here, not very much, but a little bit. So let me look at it, okay? Let's try to explain how it works, okay? So in January, our demand was 780, okay? Uh, if you look here, we have a 2.931 number of units per worker in January, okay? So this number, 
uh, should be multiplied with the number of workers we need. So we can kind of compute here the number of workers needed to cover the money in January. You agree? So if I take 780 and div divide by this number, 2.9 G1, that produces the number, the minimal number of workers needed to cover the month in January only. Okay? Minimal number of workers needed to cover demand in January. And these numbers can, can be computed, of course. It turns out to be 267. So if I take that one, divide by that, I get something around 200. This is close to 3, so that seems reasonable. If I look at January and February together, then my aggregate or my added up demand equals 780 plus 640. If you recall the numbers I just took out, that should be the case. You can see, uh, you can't see it here, can you? Yeah, uh, it's probably in the previous uh, slide. That was not here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seven hundred eighty six forty. As you can see, this is the, the total demand for the two first first months. Now, if you just uh, kind of test here, if. Um, If we stick to 267 in both months, so we don't do anything, we just keep this number in January and February, and we can see what will happen then. In that case, we will produce Mm, 267 times 2.9 G1. This comes from January. Number of workers times number of units produced per worker in that month. And we will have to add a similar number for the next month, which is February, which is 3517. So if we keep our amount, we, we see already that this is silly, don't we? Because there is less needs in February. So we kind of don't need that big amount, uh, uh, at least not in the aggregate sense. Uh, if we kind of compute this, we see that then we will produce 1740, which is larger and the actual aggregate here, which turns out to be 1420, I think. No? Oh, yes, 1420. So, uh, so this one is larger than 1420, so we kind of don't need this big amount aggregated, do we? So if we kind of open up for varying this number, no? We can kind of put in a variable. Let's so say that x times 2.931 plus the same number of employees. We should keep it constant now times 3.517 should then equal the amount we need here, which is 1420. Then we can compute this equation to find the minimal x needed. And this x would then be 1420 divided, if you kind of add together, putting the x as a common factor outside, we have to add this and divide by that one. 2.931 plus 3.517, we end up with 221, I think. At least close to 221. And of course, we can continue this argument, can't we? Move to the next period, add together this one, this one, and that one, and take the aggregate demand here, add together and divide by to get a new factor, and keep on for all months. And then we can kind of pick the necessary number in that in that line to kind of make this work. And this is done in uh, 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 
Where, where, where am I going now? Windows 7 kills me. What happened to my... No, I only have these ones here. Can I, can I move back? What happens if I do this? Then I get rid of it. Then I get rid of it. Then I get rid of it. Then I'm suddenly out of front there. Yes, I am. Silly. Okay, sorry about this. I seem I have to go in again. Ah, okay. <clears throat> there we are. Uh, documents, nature notes. That should be table 3.3, three, three, I think. Yeah, you see these numbers here? 267, 221, you see here? So a similar process here to kind of end up with the final minimal amount of workers you need to kind of cover all the amount in all periods. So the point is, is here is, of course, that you, you utilize the possibility to build inventory. So you, in certain periods, you produce and you put it into inventory, and you use it in other periods where you kind of need to add to it. And so you do this exactly in the kind of uh, way which makes it work, so to speak. So here we have our point. Ah, we need a break here. Sorry, I was... Uh, okay, 15.